This week on ACT OUT, did you know that showering less will save some water? Sadly, not millions of gallons that fracking operations use in a day, nor will it keep your water safe from contamination or your house from exploding. Next, the deadly exchange between the U.S. and Israel that pedestals police brutality, racism, and oppression. Benjamin Douglas from Jewish Voice for Peace gives us the scoop. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT, I'm Eleanor Goldfield and this is your Tipping Point. A recent Duke University study shows that between 2011 and 2016, the amount of fracking wastewater rose 1,440%. Furthermore, the amount of water used for fracking in the U.S. rose 770 percent in that same time period. Meanwhile, the study found that fracking operations ultimately use more water than they find oil or gas. For instance, in California in 2013, more than 3 billion barrels of produced water were extracted along with some 0.2 billion barrels of oil. Yeah, that ratio is pretty much shit, particularly for a state that's been on fire the better part of two years. So in other words, we are pressure washing rocks with millions of gallons of fresh water in order to find a smaller amount of oil and gas, thereby releasing a toxic mix of water laced with chemicals and radioactive materials, only to add to that the toxins released from burning fossil fuels. Because progress, right? And we'll get to the issue of siphoning fresh water from stressed watersheds in a minute, but first, let's address the issue of wastewater, because it's mind-boggling. Indeed, even a lawyer with an oil and gas-friendly law firm admitted in a recent interview, one of the things I think we can lose sight of is just how much produced water we are creating, which is more on a per-day basis than Niagara Falls has going over it in an hour. Produced water, by the way, is a term used by the fossil fuel industry to refer to toxic wastewater. It's just that produced water sounds better. And sure, when you're talking about the 1 trillion gallons of produced water annually, that sounds a lot better than saying, hey, fossil fuel companies dump almost 1 trillion gallons of radioactive wastewater kind of wherever they feel like it every year. And when I say wherever they want, check where you're standing. Wastewater disposal, which often uses injection wells that pump toxic water down underground into areas where oil has been pumped out, is suspected not only of playing a role in causing earthquakes across the U.S., but also linked by scientists to the emergence of massive sinkholes. On top of this, you might be thinking, gee, I, I wonder if pumping toxic water into the ground where groundwater comes from could be a problem. Yeah, yeah it is. First, let's set the scene. Fracking wastewater contains, as we mentioned, radioactive materials as well as corrosive salts. It also includes fracking chemicals whose identities are considered trade secrets and which even the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency can't list. Wouldn't want you all stealing the secret to slowly poisoning your own groundwater now, would we? Now, with regards to injection wells, companies are supposed to inject the water back into geologic formations that don't contain any usable groundwater. However, a loophole in the Safe Drinking Water Act allows oil and gas companies to apply for what's called an aquifer exemption, which allows them to inject wastewater into aquifers that potentially hold high-quality drinking water. Yes, I'm serious. Frack Tracker put together a map of all the areas in the country that have these exemptions. Take a look. Each dot represents a specific exemption point. The pink areas represent exemption counties, and the blue areas represent whole clusters of exemption counties. Take a screenshot and just, just, just sit with that for a minute. And then consider that already back in 2013, Research showed that almost 1 in 10 U.S. watersheds were stressed, meaning that the demand for water exceeds the natural supply available. It also just so happens that a lot of fracking operations hunker down in places with serious water woes. 
We touched upon some of this in episode 160 when we talked about the water wars happening in the West. But take, for instance, Texas. Texas has more than 300,000 active oil and gas wells. The state is also getting hit hard by a combination of hotter than normal weather and decreased rainfall. The added heat evaporates surface water, while of course the decreased rainfall can't possibly fill depleted water stores. So, companies siphon water from stressed watersheds and then pump secret poison water back into the ground, often affecting groundwater thanks to state-sponsored loopholes. And the problem will only grow more acute in coming years as research shows that water usage in fracking operations is rising, up to 50 times more in the next dozen years. Meanwhile, back in Texas, as these 300,000 plus oil and gas wells keep on trucking, local governments are urging their citizens to water their lawns less and maybe skip a shower or two. I agree fuck lawns. But it's just too bad that skipping a shower won't save millions of gallons of water, nor will it save your water from being contaminated or your house from exploding. Last week, dozens of explosions apparently triggered by a natural gas pipeline rupture rocked three communities in Massachusetts on Thursday, causing multiple injuries and evacuations. Roughly 70 gas explosions were tallied, and at one point, 18 separate blazes were raging in Andover. At least one person died, an 18-year-old, and more than a dozen were injured, according to initial reports. Earlier this month, an explosion in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, destroyed a house, garages, and took down six high-tension electric towers. The pipeline in question went into service on September 3rd, exploded on September 10th, and is operated by Energy Transfer Partners. The same company who owns the Mariner East 2 pipeline that we've covered multiple times on this show. It's really, it's really a wonder why folks don't want these pipelines running through their backyards. If the lack of our poisoned water doesn't get you, the explosions will. Fracking is so absurdly destructive. You'd think that we have no other option but to drown ourselves in toxic sludge or blow ourselves up if we want to live in a modern world. But it's actually because of the modern world that we don't need to live like this. A report last week from the Center for Alternative Technology says clean energy could now meet all our electricity needs using only existing technology at all times of the day and all year round. You wouldn't have to lose one hour of Netflix time, not one second of air conditioning, heating, hair curling, bedtime reading, or whatever the hell else you use electricity for. We need fracking like we need a cup of secret sauce chemical wastewater or an exploded house. There is no fucking reason to frack, period, at all, ever. And if we want to save our dwindling supply of clean water, we have to recognize that real quick. To learn more about fracking in your area and how to fight it, visit fracktracker.org. Moving on today, earlier this year, Durham, North Carolina became the first city in the United States to ban police exchanges with Israel, part of what the national organization Jewish, Jewish Voice for Peace calls the deadly exchange. Elsewhere in the country, the push to end this deadly exchange continues. Here in D.C., Jewish Voice for Peace has submitted FOIA requests in order to get details regarding the programs that police in the Metropolitan Police Department have taken part in. With police brutality a common reality, particularly for black and brown communities here and elsewhere, it's disgusting to think that these ideas are being shared and promoted between brutal cops here and occupying apartheid forces in Israel. And if you recall from last week, we covered Israel's disdain for Black Lives Matter due to BLM's support of the BDS movement, tying their struggle for justice and freedom with the struggles of Palestinians. And while Israel's targeting of BLM may be new, the exchange program that fostered racism, Islamophobia, and terrorist brutality is not. The programs can be traced back to the months after 9-11, when the first delegation attended a training expedition in Israel to exchange best practices, knowledge, and expertise in counter-terrorism. 
This delegation included police, FBI, CIA, and future ICE officers. Fast forward to today, and these exchange programs are still in full swing across the country, sponsored by U.S. and Israeli government agencies, as well as private companies and organizations, including the Anti-Defamation League and the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. Marked upticks in racial profiling, airport security pat-downs and body searches, surveillance, crowd control, and extreme use of force are areas where we can clearly see the influence of these exchanges of these exchange programs. Considering the source, this is of course not really that surprising. Israel has half a century of experience as an occupying force terrorizing and oppressing Palestinians every single day. The former head of Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service, Avi Dichter, who has advocated dropping heavy bombs on civilian occupied Gaza apartment buildings, believes there's an intimate connection between fighting criminals and fighting terrorists. He calls these threats crimiterrorists. Still, to be fair, it's not like the U.S. doesn't have its own experience in brutally policing its people. After all, our modern-day cops are descended from slave patrols. Racism is as inextricably linked to our cops as a bloated sense of self-importance. But rather than addressing our systemic brutality, our law enforcement agencies are looking to uh, give it a boost. Jewish Voice for Peace and other coalition partners like those who ended this exchange program in Durham are standing up to shut this down. Last week, Benjamin Douglas, organizer and chair of the Legislative Committee at Jewish Voice for Peace DC Metro, sat down with us to discuss this initiative as well as what he's found out about the training program. Take a look. So first off, uh, talk a little bit about the Israeli military and the police. Uh, is there a distinction there? Um, there is a distinction between uh, Israeli military and police, um, but it is perhaps one with limited substance because the police are heavily militarized. Mm -hmm. uh, the military in large swaths of the country or in the West Bank um, does day-to-day -day policing and the police in East Jerusalem are administering full-on legal apartheid just as surely as in the West Bank. So there is a technical distinction, but um, I would say it's of no moral significance. Right. So talk about what goes into these trainings uh, and um, so what, what, uh, what the Israeli forces are, are training the, the MPD in specifically. That's an excellent question. <laughs> um, and the short answer is we don't have the full story. Um, we've fought uh, DC police uh, FOIA over this and they're trying to get an itinerary. Um, we've got some glimpse from past trips um, and uh, a FOIA that was filed in Orlando, Florida by the journalist Alex Kane. And actually JVP and a group called, I believe the Center for Studying the US-Israeli Alliance mm -hmm. uh, just released a report that's got more substantive details about it. Um, but as far as our efforts to find out the particulars in DC, it's been very limited. They've been dragging their feet to the point where the uh, commander who went last year told us to our faces that it, was, it wasn't really training. Uh, it was just some seminars. It, you know, she saw some things she admired, but there were things she was doing anyway. It didn't really affect her policing at all. Mm -hmm. And she didn't keep any of the materials. Like, it was just like a boring lecture that... This is the presentation she gave to us in a, a, a meeting. There was just like boring lectures and she threw the materials out effectively before she left Israel. Contrast the police chief, who is the uh, other person on the force right now that we know has participated. He said it was the best training he's had in his 28 years as a police officer. So what is so great about the training or what is so indifferent about the training uh, still to some extent remains a mystery. Um, but we know it's with Israeli National Police. It's also to some extent with private entities and with uh, military and intelligence officials. We know they go to the occupied Golan Heights, and um, there are some indications that there's some pretty hardcore Islamic, Islamophobic right. propaganda involved. So, Have you seen anything, uh, and this might be too specific or too, too opaque of a question, but have you noticed anything in the way that MPD has, uh, has acted since these trainings started to suggest that they've gotten those, that specifically from Israeli forces? Uh, there's one very specific thing, and that's driving around with the lights on all the time. Mm. Um, it's not the full siren, but if you look around at DC police, they've got the 
like a, a small beep of a light on each side alternating. And they took that specifically from Israel, um, from Israeli forces. And it's just to, well, they say to assert to people that they're in, in, in good hands because security is present. Oh, to, yeah. <laughs> it's to assert dominance and it's a constant presence that right. you can't just have a marked car. You need like a, a, something more aggressive than that. Um, in terms of the specific practices, it's, it's a, always a chicken and egg type of right. scenario. And why did they go there in the first place um, if this weren't their model? We certainly know that Chief Newsham has a track record um, from the Pers Pershing Park uh, crackdown on, um, you know, tactics that are more befitting uh, an occupying type force. Yeah. And we certainly see in terms of jump outs, racial mm -hmm. profiling, things which obviously predate it. But um, there is a, a large amount of common ground, obviously. And, and you mentioned the Islamophobia being part of the, the training. And of course, Israel came out and, and um, or it's been shown that Israel is anti-Black Lives Matter um, and has, has said openly, um, I believe uh, Avi Dichter, former head of Shin Bet, said that um, he appreciated the war on drugs and how the police have responded to that. Uh, do you feel that the that there's... I mean, obviously, since you don't have the FOIA information, this is going to be conjecture to some extent, but how much do you think that that racism and Islamophobia is, uh, plays a part in these trainings? Uh, I think it plays a huge part. Um, and the interesting thing about the war on drugs, this is longstanding and uh, goes both ways. Um, I was actually talking to a friend about these trainings, and she related her grandfather was part of a Houston police force that right after the end of Jim Crow, participate in training Israeli police. Mm -hmm. So deep roots the other way. Officially, the state of alert that we've had since 9-11 in this country is a neutral thing. It's just, you know, if you see something, say something, security everywhere. That in itself would be, right. would be no way to have a free society, even if it were neutral in some way, but obviously it's not. Um, it's intensely racialized. Um, so you mentioned the, 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 the exchange program aspect of it. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Have you found information about that exchange program? Um, there's indication. I can't speak to the specifics mm -hmm. in terms of what is being imparted. Um, this principal program by the uh, Anti-Defamation League, a civil rights group, um, is principally showing U.S. police, um, state, local, federal, um, how Israel, you know, is the Harvard of counterterrorism counter as they advertise themselves, uh, how they do these things. Um, so that's the principal idea is that they can see the, the great model of Israel in terms of surveillance, in terms of how they react to, to attacks and how they crack down on prospect of attacks. So. And part of this, uh, and, and of course, again, because you don't have the FOIA, but uh, part of this also seems to be the fact that we are supplying Israel with so much weaponry. So it's not just the exchange program in terms of ideas, it's an actual like physical weaponry program as well, it seems. Yeah, it's intimately tied to it. Um, and I found it very apt and, uh, and very pointed. The only public official around here who's spoken out about this specifically is council member at large, David Grasso. Mm -hmm. And he, he grouped those two issues together. He had just written a letter to the police chief about um, the federal program under Trump uh, where they're disbursing military-style equipment. And I think he was the only person to speak out about that. Why did D.C. police getting more military? Why are they getting more military-grade equipment? Immediately after, similarly, why are they going to train with Israeli police and military? Um, that's... It is a natural corollary, I would say, to the long-standing U.S. federal program of arming the bejesus out of uh, the Israeli state. So. Yeah, and then of course part of that is militarizing our own police because if we're going to train with the Israeli military and police, which as you mentioned, there's not a clear distinction, yeah. um, that only further uh, you know, impresses upon our police that, oh, we should be more militarized. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's intensely dialectical, and that's why would they be looking there in the first place if they weren't taking this more militarized surveillance model, and what are they gaining from seeing an ultra-militarized, you know, heavily legalized profiling type of heavy surveillance model in Israel. So, yeah. um, so what, are, what exactly is JVP calling for with regards to these trainings? Uh, we're calling for a lot of things. Uh, I will say the local campaign 
Um, we want first and foremost for them to stop. And we've got a call to the MPD. Um, not exactly a, an institution that's, that's principally accountable to uh, civilians. But uh, we've got to call on them just to stop. And then we've got to call on the council uh, to compel them to stop, to actually act as leaders, listen to the voice of the people, um, and, and listen to what we're saying about this and the lack of any clamor for more training with occupying armies, at least right. from what I've heard. Um, so partly just to get them to make it stop. And hopefully, I think, to, to create some type of mechanism where people can speak out about this. Why should this be decided in secret in the first place? Mm -hmm. Why should this be up to the police chief entirely? There's, a, there's actually a regulation in D.C. that says no public official can train a facility that practices discrimination in ways that violate. Uh, it's a list of protected categories under the D.C. Human Rights Act. So race, religion, gender, orientation, identity, all these things. And very clearly in violation. So right. w why won't someone do something about this? Um, and then further than that, we also call on them to think about reinvestment. Think about investing more in communities, more in other models of safety, less in, in this militarized policing model. So, Is there a specific, it, how is the mayor involved in this, or is she? Um, the mayor, apart from appointing uh, Chief Newsham, I don't believe that uh, she's had any direct involvement. Um, she's condemned the boycott divestment sanctions movement. All right. um, when we tried to meet with her and talk about it, she was very non-receptive. So um, I would love it if she spoke out. And I think that that's what the people who elected her uh, in large, large numbers uh, would like. Um, but I, I don't have any involvement beyond that. Right. And she's the one who, of course, uh, got Newsham his permanent spot. So it seems yes. <laughs> she seems to be on his side, unfortunately. Very much so. Um, so, so finally, talk about how this ties into the, the broader goals of what Jewish Voice for Peace does. Well, um, we support peace through justice, peace with justice. And um, some years ago, this shifted from a I mean, I won't say it's not flexible, but from a more amorphous picture of that, but in the case of Israel-Palestine, to a model of full equality and human rights for everyone. So not just ending the occupation of the territories uh, uh, in 67, not just full equality for, for the Palestinian citizens in 48, um, but also the right of return. And basing on that human rights model, however it's sliced. And um, we support the boycott divestment sanctions movement for concrete pressure cultural pressure, economic pressure, I would say, first and foremost. And so this ties into that. The people talk about boycotts, but it's boycott divestments and sanctions. And that means state divestment, effectively, institutional divestment and also state divestment, which is sanctions. Um, and so this ties into that intimately. Stop treating occupation as a model. Mm -hmm. I would say this also links on a domestic front to our broader vision of not peace through clamping down, not peace through militarized suppression, of, of dissident forces, but peace through, through justice and equal rights, because the very models of policing or the very ideas that these exchanges endorse on a domestic level are intensely racist. And so it's, it's joining not only with BDS, but also with the Movement for Black Lives call um, for community reinvestment. So what would you say to, um, to people that might want to organize around this issue or get involved, uh, per particularly uh, for, for Jews who stand against the state of Israel? I mean, I would say there are a lot of great organizations. Um, on our specific campaign, to, to talk more broadly, on our specific campaign, we've gotten great reception from other, uh, other left and progressive groups. Um, from Pan-African Community Action um, and, and other groups within the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter DC, Black Youth Project, to uh, groups that organize on things that are in the, the, I would say, compartmentalized liberal mindset not associated, like Collective Action for Safe Spaces, right. the Anti-Street Harassment Group, um, looking at how policing participates in harassment. Um, and so across the board, so tap into those organizations. If you're part of an organization, bring this up. Raise this issue. We, you know... Um, I'm going to misattribute the quote, I'm sorry, but uh, was, I think it was Audre Lorde. She said, you can't have a single issue struggle because there's no, sing no one lives a single issue life. Right, yeah. And so whatever your organization is, try and tap in there. Um, in terms of Jews and, and Jewish identity and challenging this 
perverse association uh, with a religion and a culture and an identity uh, and an ethnicity on the one hand with a specific political movement and in particular specific oppressive state. Um, there are lots of ways to speak out. Uh, there are more groups uh, doing it. Jewish Voice for Peace is um, obviously where I would, I would propose, but there are other groups uh, articulating different visions, if not now, um, International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, um, and just raise that question. And, and I would also say stop. We need to stop being on the defensive about this. Right. We're not asserting that there's no linkage between, um, between your ethnic or cultural background or your religion on the one hand and this political entity, this oppressive state on the other. Why would you ever assume that in the first place, yeah. right? We need to, to shift the discourse. Um, because that would also imply that me as an American, I support the American empire, which I don't. Exactly. <laughs> so. Exactly. Um, or that that's somehow, yeah, that's somehow crushing a portion of your identity to, right. to look at the oppressive politics that some people, for whatever need, uh, want to associate with it. So. Visit deadlyexchange.org to find out more about the movement to stop these trainings. And if you're in the D.C. area, you can go to this address right now to sign on in support of Jewish Voice, Voice for Peace's work, occupationfreedc.org slash petition. Also, to search in your area for U.S.-Israel state violence, visit palestineishere.org, where you can track local police exchanges via their map and list tool. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people that you don't know. Check out that last slide and the show description to find the sites that I've mentioned in this week's show. And for interim updates, as well as posted videos, images, and articles, visit us on social media. To those who have donated to keep us acting out, thank you so much. Please do keep spreading the word in order to ensure our ability to keep acting out. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, visit patreon.com slash act out. I'm not a violent man, but I